Welcome to this week's edition of A Plus Weekly, my news roundup of what has caught my eye this week in the tech world, focusing on the Apple ecosystem and all the things that are newsworthy, useful, and some fun too. If you're new here, welcome, welcome. It's good to see you. This is a podcast kind of show, so I'll be pretty relaxed with light edits. You might even have seen some standalone clips, which make you curious about the full show. If that's true, please drop me a comment below to let me know that you found the show that way. With that said, welcome again, and let me roll on with the show. Apple is opening a sales region in India on its own. Personally, I can see why. The viewing figures for my channel at the smaller end of the range has shown an increase in my viewership from India. It's now second overall and number one for my shorts. India is a market that is growing in terms of consuming media, and it makes sense that sales of devices to consume that media are also increasing. For Apple, this is a little weird. Though sales went down recently, revenue went up, which means that they may be, they can, or already are starting to see consumers willing to pay more for their hardware and software products. That was record revenue in the last quarter, even though sales were down 5%. Anyway, I was quite excited about this news and what it might offer to my Indian audience. I suspect that Apple is applying all they learned from when they first ventured into the China market in their attempts to scale this India market. And there are also signs that they are starting to de-risk their global supply chain further away from China. And guess who's getting some of that action? That's right, they're working with Foxconn to set up new iPhone production facilities in India as suppliers move into the region too. Apple and Foxconn have pushed for new labor rules in Karnataka, India, to reduce their use of Chinese manufacturing. The new law there allows two shift production in India similar to what they can do in China. The law lets a factory squeeze out more production with two 12-hour shifts. Karnataka, which is a state in India, used to cap shifts at nine hours. And you can see why. I mean, workers' rights need to be protected in all this too, right? There have been some pretty horrific stories about worker conditions, and I wonder what might happen in India in their quest for more industrial clout, helping Western giants de-risk their China-based manufacturing. It also reduced the limits on nighttime labor for women, who are a major part of production lines elsewhere in the world. India is making the most of companies shift towards different labor sources due to pandemic causing issues in China. India is due to become the next big manufacturing hub, a government official told the Financial Times. When we compare India with other countries, we have to increase by a big margin our efficiency in terms of increasing the work output. Apple has produced lower-end iPhones in the country since 2017, but has faced issues with quality control and it's been comparatively slow. Now, it came out recently that Foxconn is investing $700 million on a plant just for iPhones in Bengaluru, the biggest city in Karnataka. In January this year, India's trade minister said Apple wants to up its local manufacturing from 5 to 7% to 25%, but didn't say when. Now at the shareholder event earlier this week, Tim Cook said he sees an incredible amount of opportunity in India and reiterated plans to soon open the company's first store in the nation. Cook talked up growth also in Brazil, Indonesia, and Mexico. Stay tuned for sales and manufacturing resets to the Apple Dominion coming soon. There's more on India in a related story, but from a security standpoint that could have further downflow effects for other countries like China too. India reportedly wants Apple and other smartphone makers to let users remove pre-installed apps plus screen OS updates, according to Reuters. Smartphone producers have to provide an uninstall option for pre-installed apps due to new rules and new models will be checked by a lab authorized by the Bureau of Indian Standards Agency to make sure they're compliant according to people in the know. Apple lets you get rid of some of its own apps, but the main ones like messages, photos, and phone can only be hidden away in the app library 
not deleted. The sources in the report said India's IT ministry is looking into the rules because of spying and mishandling user data, and they mentioned the Chinese risk specifically. An unnamed official commented that pre-installed apps could be a weak security point and they wanted to make sure no foreign countries, such as China, were taking advantage of it. It's a matter of national security, they said. India has blocked over 300 Chinese apps, such as TikTok, since a clash with China in 2022. Chinese investments have also come under tougher inspection. Now, according to Reuters, who saw government documents, the four companies, Xiaomi, Samsung, Apple, and Vivo, had a private meeting to discuss the plan. Apparently, the government is giving phone companies a year to comply with the regulations when it takes effect. But there's a fear that it could postpone the release of new phones and cause business losses. And here's why. It usually takes around 21 weeks for a smartphone and its parts to get tested by India's IT ministry for safety compliance. That's quite some delay. Okay, here's more on touchscreens for Macs. You'll have seen from last week's A Plus Weekly that there's been some noise on a possible touchscreen Mac, possibly coming down the line a couple of years from now. Let's talk a bit more about what we know about what might be to come. Mark Gurman over at Bloomberg seems pretty sure that Apple engineers are quite actively engaged in a development of a Mac with a touchscreen, with the first cab off the rank likely to be a MacBook Pro. It will most likely continue to feature a trackpad and keyboard as well as a display that supports touch input, just like an iPhone or an iPad. But it doesn't look like we're going to see an integration of iPad OS and Mac OS anytime soon, even though we've definitely seen a blurring of those product lines with the launch of the M series of Silicon Macs, which also features in the latest iPads. But how much of this talk is just completely speculative? I mean, what are the chances of this ever happening at all. Apple software engineering chief Craig Federighi in 2020 said the Apple said that Apple believed Mac ergonomics require the hands to be rested on a surface, claiming that lifting your arm up to poke a screen is fatiguing. Touchscreen laptops from other companies were also not compelling to Apple. I don't think we've ever looked at any of the other guys to date and said how fast can we get there? And that kind of opposition to touchscreens on Macs at Apple has been pretty entrenched for almost a decade now. But is it true now, in 2023? I mean, just take a look at what the competition is doing. Almost all PC manufacturers make some kind of touch-based tablet laptop hybrid device, many of which are positioned as all-in-one or convertible machines, including Samsung, one of Apple's major competitors offering a Galaxy Book, which has a traditional keyboard and trackpad along with that touchscreen. So can Apple afford to stay out of the game for much longer? I mean, I have no problem using my iPad Pro along with my Magic Keyboard and trackpad built in. And I know it's optimized for iPad OS, but it, it doesn't look like a bridge that can't be built. And I find the combination invaluable. And it's definitely my preferred option in most cases when I am working remotely. I think there's a market. So I wonder if Apple is stepping up to exploit it. So Apple Classical Music is here. Well, it's been announced anyway, coming to Apple Music subscribers on March 28th as a free additional benefit offering over 5 million classical music tracks. It's a direct result of Apple acquiring Prime Phonic back in 2021. It will also offer hundreds of curated playlists and thousands of exclusive albums. Apple says it's been working with classical music artists and institutions to offer exclusive content and recordings in Apple Music Classical, including high res lossless and spatial audio tracks. Spatial audio is something I'm especially looking forward to, to trying with the dedicated classical music app and platform. Some interesting news on what we know is that it will be an iPhone only standalone app to start with. No iPad app will be available, which I find kind of odd given what I think a user profile of the iPad user might be but that's what we've heard. It also won't be available on Apple Music's lower cost music voice plan. You'll need the full deal to get it or the premier service of Apple One. 
If you want to know more, follow Apple Classical on Twitter to track news and updates about the app launching on March 28th. But here's how to get it as soon as it's available. Head to the Apple Music Classical App Store listing on your iPhone, tap the blue Get button, and then use your side button to confirm the pre-order. Keep in mind, the new app is free, but it does require an Apple Music subscription. Now, Apple Music Classical will auto-download to your iPhone as soon as it's available on March 28th. Is there a new HomePod coming? According to analyst Ming-Chi Kuo, Apple is set to release a new HomePod in the first half of 2024. Yes, I know one has only just been released, but this new theory reckons that it will have a 7-inch display. In a post on Medium, Kuo thought that this next-generation HomePod display could help with deeper integration with Apple's other hardware. That's not a new thought. Mark Gurman from Bloomberg, again, Back in 2021, suggested that Apple was working on new HomePod models with displays and cameras, and I guess mics too, alongside multi-touch functionality. A combined Apple TV HomePod device would be a really interesting and potentially compelling and evolutionary product, as well as reportedly working on a HomePod with a screen mounted on a robotic arm. HomePod already operates on a version of tvOS, so an evolution in that to some kind of hybrid home OS seems like a path forwards, and there are some signs that Apple is working on just such an operating system. Apple looks like it's playing catch up here, but I wonder if they'll do the same thing, the usual thing of being late to market, but best in market too. Evolutionary but perhaps not revolutionary. Plus, I know that whilst not perfect, I'd much rather trust Apple with my data security than some other companies with similar products in the market. Here's Apple's continual pivoting towards health. Last year, the Apple Watch Series 8 introduced a temperature sensor that can track your body's temperature while you sleep and a cycle tracking feature. As noted with Apple getting into blood glucose monitoring, Last week, there's more evidence that Apple is tipping towards adopting a health-focused arm as a company. Again from German at Bloomberg, the AirPods could be focused even more towards becoming a viable hearing aid option for the millions of people who need such assistance. AirPods already come with live listen and conversation boost, which allows users to better hear what they want to focus on in their immediate environment. This functionality isn't FDA approved and it isn't meant to function as a hearing aid replacement yet. So if Apple wants to develop this segment, they'll have some regulatory hoops to jump through as well as some technological development work. But I can certainly see this as a possible pathway and tens of millions of people may thank them for it. I mean, have you seen how much current hearing aid technology costs? Okay, is this mixed reality headset actually ready? Apple's mixed reality headset is still on the cards. In fact, Tim Cook apparently thinks it's ready to go. But the Financial Times is reporting that the company's design team has a different take on that. Cook is reportedly pushing ahead with its launch against the wishes of Apple's top designers. They hoped to debut a more lightweight pair of AR glasses instead of the much bulkier headset that Apple's expected to reveal in June this year. Remember, this headset has been in development for seven years. That's reportedly twice as long as the iPhone, and the stakes are high for the CEO. The headset will be the first of Apple's new computing platforms to be developed entirely under Cook's leadership. The iPhone, iPad, and even the watch were originally designed by Apple co-founder Steve Jobs, along with Johnny Ives. The timing of the launch has been a source of tension since the project began in early 2016, according to several people familiar with Apple's internal discussions. Apple's operations team wanted to ship a first edition product, a ski goggle-like headset that lets users watch immersive 3D video, perform interactive exercises, or chat with realistic avatars through a revamped FaceTime. But Apple's industrial design team advised patience, wanting to delay until a lightweight version of augmented reality glasses became 
technically feasible. Most in the tech industry expect this to take several more years. In making his decision to go ahead with the debut this year, Cook sided with Chief Operating Officer Jeff Williams according to two people familiar with Apple's decision making process and overruled early objections from Apple's designers to wait for the technology to catch up with their vision. Just a few years ago, going against the wishes of Apple's powerful design team would have been unthinkable. But since the departure of its longtime leader, Johnny Ive, in 2019, Apple's structure has been tweaked with the design now following Williams. Now, I'm with the industrial designers on this one. Unless this is a glasses type AR headset with the ability to put prescription lenses in, I can't see myself as a taker and there will be millions more like me. Are you one of the skeptical spectacle wearers too? Try saying that in a hurry three times over. Apple only expects to sell about 1 million units of its Apple Reality Pro headset in the first 12 months, according to people familiar with the planning. Less than the first generations of the iPhone or the Apple Watch in the year that they launched. It looks like it will be a complicated device which will have a set of cameras, high resolution screens, and it's expected to cost around $3,000 three times the price of the MetaQuest Pro, which could severely limit its appeal. I mean, severely limits its appeal. The choice of timing is critical. According to a report in the Financial Times, Cook and Williams acknowledge the state of the market and believe it makes sense to enter the fray now, even if the first generation headset will be expensive and of limited appeal to consumers. The idea is to iterate and improve over time. Apple has a long history of starting slowly when it enters new product categories and then breaking into the market within a few years. Amit Daryanani, an analyst at Evercore ISI, said that Apple often uses its first generation product to capture the interest of loyal Apple users and act as a catalyst for its brand developer community. And Morgan Stanley analysts offered this comment to its clients. The market has historically underestimated the long-term impact of novelty product service launch. And rumors are that a lower priced second generation headset device is already said to be in development with Foxconn. Trademark filings suggest the cheaper headset could be branded Apple Reality One. We shall see. Excuse the pun. And just to round this segment up, we may have gotten a peek at some cables and sensors for this much discussed Apple VR AR headset. Mr. White128's protected Twitter account had pics that Mac Rumors and 9to5Mac shared, and it looks like the cables could be for a pair of goggle like eyewear things. Not super obvious from the pictures what the cables are doing other than connecting the left and right sides of the headset. Without much more information, there's not loads that we can figure out from them. And the pictures are pretty shady. The person who posted them didn't come out and say that they were from a headset. And Mac Rumors reports that the caption for the tweet was just a sunglasses face emoji. If the parts are the real deal, it could add credence to the gossip that Apple will announce the headset at WWDC and get it out by the end of 2023. If the company is ramping up production, that could explain why there are leaks. That would be about when we'd expect them. Word on the street last year was that Apple was producing the headset starting in March 2023. So that lines up too. Next, iPhone 14's emergency SOS rolls out to six new countries. That's going to happen later this month. This expansion follows Apple's initial launch in the US and Canada and its first expansion to the United Kingdom, France, Germany and Ireland. So it's coming to Austria, Belgium, Italy, Luxembourg, Netherlands and Portugal. Now this emergency SOS via satellite enables messaging with emergency services when outside of cellular or Wi-Fi coverage. Once your iPhone is connected to a satellite, you can reach emergency services regardless as to whether you have cellular or Wi-Fi coverage or not. Satellite connectivity can also be used to share your location with friends and family via Find My. Apple has created a compression algorithm which makes text messages three times smaller to make communication faster because bandwidth is low compared to cellular networks. 
satellite connectivity is also integrated by default with crash detection. Now this feature has already been praised many times by first responders and rescue teams where they've seen the feature kick in to help people communicate with those first responders in dire situations many times already. And once this feature kicks into New Zealand, it might be the thing that persuades me to get an Apple Watch Ultra once I eventually upgrade from my Series 5 because hey, it's on that too. All right, it's time for an iOS 17 news update. We've still got a few months till the June unveiling of iOS 17, but we know a bit about that update because Apple's already working on it and stuff gets out. iOS doesn't look like it will have as many improvements as Apple had wanted since they have had to turn their attention to this headset coming out this year. According to Bloomberg, Apple's engineers are putting more effort into the headset and XROS and not as much into iOS 17 and iPad. OS 17. That means there won't be as much as when iOS 16 gave us a bunch of design and functional updates. I mean, it's probably the best update yet. It looks like we'll see that support for the mixed reality headset. It will be able to stand alone and have its own app store, but it could still have some kind of connection with the iPhone, like handoff at least. CarPlay updates are coming too. At the 2022 WWDC, Apple showed off an improved CarPlay with deeper integration with cars so you can use it to change the volume or switch the radio station. We're likely going to see support for sideloading and alternate app stores too. Apple will have to let you sideload from 2024 because of EU legislation, so they plan to start changing iOS 17 from that point on. Europeans wouldn't need to use the app store for apps. Apple has to let them use different ones. Developers don't get charged 15 to 30% for apps installed through other means, but Apple will still get a cut. To begin with, those sideloading changes will be just for EU customers, but as other nations go with law changes like the Digital Markets Act in Europe, Apple could be forced to extend it. Now, making major changes for sideloading support could really mess with iOS 17 development since it'll take a lot of engineering resources to do that. iOS 17 is going to be previewed at WWDC in June 2023, or at least it's scheduled to. Once WWDC is done, developers will be able to get their hands on iOS 17 for testing, and a public beta is expected to arrive in July. And when that beta testing is done, iOS is scheduled to launch with the new iPhones in September 2023. Apple Books have started to get AI narration. When you look through Apple Books for your next audiobook, you may come across some titles with a note that says that they were narrated by Apple Books. That's because Apple has released a selection of books that uses its AI-powered digital narration service. Apple said that the service uses advanced speech synthesis technology. It's developed itself to produce high-quality audiobooks from an ebook file. Now, The Guardian has reported that Apple spoke with independent publishers about potentially partnering for the project's launch recently. They heard from Apple that they would cover all the costs and they'd get royalties for their audiobooks too. Apple kept their identity a secret and had partners sign NDAs too. In their statement, Apple highlighted how producing audiobooks and recruiting voice actors could set writers and publishers back thousands. I know, yes, it does cost thousands from my own personal experience. Independent authors starting out don't always have the money to spare. And yeah, it's really tough. The audiobook market, however, has grown a lot recently. It earned $1.6 billion in 2021, and experts think it could be worth over $35 billion in 2030. Writers could be missing out on cash and the chance to attract more followers if they don't make audiobooks. And even when you do, it doesn't always work. Again, I speak from experience. Apple reckons that their digital narration tech will make audiobook creation simpler. And that's definitely possible. If this project succeeds, it could totally revolutionize audiobooks. Digital voice books aren't anything new, but they usually sound so robotic they're hard to listen to. Apple currently offers authors two digital voices to select from, a soprano and a baritone. They sound pretty human based on the samples that the company shared, but the sound clips were short and might not be a genuine representative quality. 
For now, Apple is only accepting books in the romance and other fiction genres. The books need to be on Apple Books, need to be in English, they need to pass an editorial review. But they're also increasing AI narrations availability and it will be out there for nonfiction and self-development authors soon. The company is also introducing two more digital voices for those genres. For now, you can listen to audiobooks that use Apple's AI by searching for AI narration. Let me know in the comments if you find any and what you think. Hey, subscribe and hit that bell to make sure you don't miss my next video. I'm Saab Johal and this channel is A+. I hope you've enjoyed this new feature that's coming up weekly from now on. Try this video next and thanks for watching. Cheers.